Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is the November 16th, 2020 regular scheduled Board of Education meeting. Uh, again, thank you to everybody who's joining us online tonight. We appreciate you uh, being with us. Uh, guys, if you'd join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Mr. Roush, roll call, please. Yep. President McFarland. Here. Vice President Singer. Here. Secretary Roush is here. Treasurer Friedel. Here. Member B Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Lauterbach. Here. Of all seven present. All right, fantastic. Uh, okay, we've got a, a bit of a schedule tonight, so we're going to jump right into our consent agenda. We have item 2.1, the approval of the minutes from October 19th, 2020, regular scheduled meeting. Uh, item 2.2 .2 is the minutes from October 27th, 2020, special meeting. Uh, 2.3 is the approval of the minutes from the November 4th, 2020, special meeting. Uh, item 2.4 is the following staff members have announced their resignation on the effective date, so those can be found on the agenda. Item 2.5 is the approval of the payment of the school system's bills for the month of September 2020 as listed in the check registers prepared by Ms. Holderby in the amount of $9,436,778. Uh, the distribution of obligations by fund is included in the documentation, and there is a list of supporting documentation below that. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda item 2.1 through 2.5. Support. Support. John, I think. Motion by Phil, support by John. Any discussion? I did see in the FFO minutes that you discussed the executive summary report and keeping it in this section. And I just wonder if you could expand on uh, what your findings were or what your decision, uh, how you came about with that decision. I'd be happy to. Uh, I believe our, our decision was based on the fact that these are, these are just supporting documentations to highlight um, the, the bill. We are not approving an executive report. The report is simply there for the purpose to uh, provide support for the actual dollar amount that's, that's yes. being approved. Okay. We also looked at other places to put it mm -hmm. and didn't identify any, any other better spot to put it. Okay, so if it's for information and it's just supporting documents, we're not going to... We had the one instance with uh, the purchase and the change order and the signage arches, and that was designated as approved because it was part of the approved consent agenda as part of this report. So I just want to make sure that we don't, we don't go through that process again. So... Okay. If that wasn't why it was approved, it was approved not because of the supporting documentation, but because it was on listed in there. So it would have been listed as a 2.2 .2 or 2.3, where your supporting documentations are, are, are supporting the 2.5 approval only. So a two, two, little bit different in that. So you have supporting documentation for your other bills available. It, Mm -hmm. as well and so it's just a, and that's why the FFO felt like it fit best in there same with expense graphs but you know same with the PO documents the supporting documents okay at, at one time remember until you requested it it was never in here it wasn't on the agenda but it was part of the packet we always had it every month it just wasn't listed on the agenda in the in the consent agenda it wasn't listed as an item, but it was part of the packet. I don't believe so, but I'd have to go back and look at that. That was my I had the question was because we had the executive summary report in there, but so it was not identified again. Brian, I think the clarification is that we're not asking that you approve that. Okay. You're approving the overall bills payable, and that's a supporting document to show, just like the POs and the uh, credit cards and all that. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we have presentation to the board. We have literacy coaching essentials. We'll have Jen Service, our elementary curriculum instructional specialist, 
kick it off and she will, Megan will bring her up in, into the screen. She has several folks with her and I'll let her introduce them as well. This ties in very well to read by grade three and what we're doing in literacy with all that movement as well. I see her. Jen, we see you. The floor is yours if you can hear us. Hang on for a second. Technology is great when it works right. Yep. <laughs> oh, is she here at the admin center? She's in her office, correct. <clears throat> we have to put her down there because we're trying to keep the capacity limit of the room within compliance. Worst case scenario, we maybe bring her down here. <laughs> Penny, can, we, can, can we hear anybody else on Zoom? Just out of curiosity. I'm guessing not. We could earlier today. We haven't had anybody speak yet. There's Megan. Mm -hmm. No. folks on Zoom hear us. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. could do, uh, Mr. McFarland, is we could go to one of the other presenters and see if they're able to go in so we can um, keep that moving so we can move to uh, the barn Mallow since they're here update. They're here present and well, and then we'll come back to Jennifer. And then we can bring Jennifer in if we have to. Correct. These, okay. All right. So we'll we'll do that. We'll make an adjustment in our, our agenda here and we'll skip right ahead to 3-2. We have our bond update with Daryl and Rick. Good evening, guys. Thanks for coming in. Happy to be here. Excited to be in person. It's been a while <laughs> since I've seen some of you guys. I mean, it feels like it's been a year, it's been, but it's been pretty close. So happy to be here tonight. We're going to kind of take a little trip down memory lane on the bond update and talk about some of the past projects. We're going to need to keep on the mic for the recording, Daryl. We're going to... Um, you know, take a little trip down memory lane, look at some past projects. We've, we've marked a pretty crucial point in the bond program with the completion of Series 1. Uh, so we want to talk about a lot of the exciting things that happened there. Um, you know, and in the spirit of the month, just, you know, express our gratitude and, you know, thanks for being a part of the bond program. Uh, I know I speak for Rick, for the two of us, you know, the Midland Public Schools. This program's been a, um, you know, it's really been one of the highlights of my career. So when we started putting this together and look at all the work that's been put in place, you know, we feel, you know, we're very happy to be here tonight to talk about a lot of these successes. And so do I have a presentation? There you go. All right, so yeah, if we, um, if we kind of start kind of looking back a little bit, everything we've done so far started back in 2014. That's when we completed the facility audit process. And so all of the projects and the budgets and everything we were going to talk about tonight, all of that originated from those original facility audit in 2014. So 
seems like light years ago, six years ago, and so, you know, enable, you know, our ability to accomplish what we set out to accomplish based on all that hard work up front um, is something that the district can be really proud of. So in 2015, the bond passed. Uh, we got a picture of the communique here, so very successful in that bond program. And we're going to move into some of the construction highlights, and then we'll finish on a summary. And I'm going to let Rick uh, take over from here. Rick's been in the district all six years since the bond program started, you know, on site, um, in, the, in the boardroom here, working every day to make sure these projects were a success. If anybody has, you know, any claim on our end to be, um, you know, critical in making this happen, it's Rick. So I'm going to let him kind of click through some of these, and then we'll finish on some, some of these slides. dates on there. Um, so in 2015, uh, just as the bond was started, uh, all we did for the first summer, not all we did, but we, we did uh, boiler replacements in both Jefferson and Northeast. Um, we took boilers out that were the size of school buses. Uh, it was a little bit unique because one of them was in a basement, so it had to come up oh, yeah. and out a window over top coal chutes. A very interesting process but very successful. Um, we put in, you know, three low boilers to replace these giants that were down there and the efficiency. Also, um, this was a lot about energy efficiency. So we also replaced the windows and the doors that led into these. They actually had single pane glass going into these boiler rooms. So everything, you know, weather in and out, there was, it was going with their, their which one? Uh, you up right there, there. Uh, okay. The red arrow. Try. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, then um, also in the next project here, we started uh, the demolition of Central. Uh, this was a unique project too because we were saving portions of it. So we had three portions of the building that we saved. So we had to do some um, some real um, upfront work. We cut a slot through the building built a wall in to protect what we were saving and then tear it down. So this was, um, you know, a lengthy project, but um, it was also a fun project because regular demo, you just simply knock the thing down and haul it away. Here we were trying to save it. Well, the video did not start, did it? There we go. Um, so there was a lot to this as far as, you know, like I said, we, we demo it all out. We have to and then get rid of all the soils below, put good soils back in to build the new project. Um, and then we started the elementary school addition. So we had 10,000 square foot additions that we added to each of the elementaries. Um, this team, Dave, um, Dave, Mike Mogenberg, all of Mike's staff, they all helped in this because there's we are adding 10,000 square foot onto a building that is fully occupied with kids. So if you look at these videos of all the stuff that we had to put into place because safety is more important than getting that building up, right? So we had to, everyone was unique. We came up with plans on how to separate them, everything from fire trucks, how do you get them in for emergencies and everything, and then the contractors working hand in hand with us and our team to make sure, you know, that nothing, you could see the gaps between the fence, not even an accident to get to that fence because it was, you know, we are all about the safety. Um, so each one was unique in where it's positioned and what we did with them. Um, the next set of projects we did was the security projects. We touched every building that summer with um, secured entrances, put in nearly 300 cameras, card access on all of the doors, um, the only building that, that got a minimal amount would have been Adams Elementary where we just put an iPhone in simply because we were going to move the office and that was one of the last <laughs> projects. So in one summer, um, we touched every building to make them secure. And then we have the STEM building. Uh, this, is the, this is titled, you know, our first day at the STEM building. This building for me was just... Unbelievable. I mean, it was fantastic to work in a building that had such great spaces uh, with the maker spaces and, um, the, you know, the studios in each one. 
um, showcasing the contractor's work. So well, Daryl and I met with contractors long before we bid this out, and we set the standards and what we wanted to see, what Midland wanted to see. Um, so with exposing everything, there was great benefits to this, right? Everybody could see all that infrastructure you can't see when there's a ceiling, and they can see, but then to turn around and use it as a learning tool, I mean, this was special. And we've won three awards for this building, and um, we've done hundreds of tours. I think Mike's even said multiple countries have come to see this building. Uh, so this for me was a, a great, great um, work uh, watching these guys. We had 120 guys a day on average in that building building this. So it was for me uh, great fun. I mean a lot of people think don't think work is fun. That was fun. <laughs> Um, so then we uh, also, as we were doing the elementary schools, we did them in three phases simply because we were taking certain spaces and turning them into different spaces. Uh, this particular uh, was at Plymouth, was the, is the maker space. This was the media center. So we had to build the addition to give them the cafeterias, turn around and then take their cafeterias, make it the media centers, make the media center into the maker space. So every, every school had this, every elementary, but each one was specific to itself. I mean, different spaces, um, just, it, it was, everyone took a lot of thought and planning from the whole team, um, which, Mike, you've got probably one of the best teams I've ever worked with is knowing what they wanted and how to get it. And so it just made it go so much smoother. Um, this is another project that I had a great deal of fun helping on. Uh, this auditorium, um, you know, since it was 1936, and you walk in that door, and I know that the district didn't want to lose that, but neither did I. That was so beautiful to be able to walk into what still looks like the 1936 auditorium. But we put an extreme amount of changes in there. I mean, it's a state of the art now. Um, you, you know, you can't go anywhere, anywhere and find anything better than this, but we kept the look. Right on down to staining the outside, everybody thinks it's a brand new building, but it is still 1936, and it's just beautiful. I had almost as much fun on this one as the stem. <laughs> Um, the other thing, uh, the next project that we did, which nobody ever gets to see these, were the virtual servers. Um, this is actually, you know, another one of those that's very complicated and where I was blessed with having Dave's crew helping with this. Uh, we were able to um, get this designed, bid out, and we did it where we replaced the one here at the admin first so we could get the district going by using the backup servers at Dow High. Once this one was up and operational, then we went to Dow High. Um, you know, and again, these are things no one will ever see but you guys because you were part of it. But it just enhanced the technology here greatly. I'm sure Dave will agree with that. Um, so as we were doing the uh, remodeling during the summers, um, each of the schools, each of the elementaries, we did refreshes just like what you're seeing here. So you're seeing a before and after. So we went in and first big project was to move all the teachers out. Put them into trailers, put them out in the parking lot. So then we would demo put it all back together from what you see there, new drywall instead of accordion walls, new tack boards and white boards instead of chalk boards, new flooring. We also um, moved it all back in and the teachers had approximately two weeks to go ahead and decorate and have their schools back together. It doesn't seem like much, but that's done in 80 days. So a lot of coordination, a lot of help from the school district uh, to make all of this happen. And I think it all went, you know, fairly well. Nothing's perfect, but everything went well. And that's a picture of what you see that they could walk into the first day of school, you know, and they didn't have to work all of Labor Day to get there. Hmm. This is the um, STEM building or addition that we put on at Woodcrest. Uh, this wasn't in the bond, but 
the Woodcrest has so many students, we didn't have a space that we could take or change into the maker space. So this addition was put on um, the following year after all the renovations and everything was done. It was also unique because just on the other side of that wall is the sidewalk where they walked into school. There was a lot of coordination, a lot of great help from contractors. Let the buses come in, let everybody get into the school, then they would go to work. A lot of coordination before and after, but it came out to an extremely beautiful space. Um, this is a before and after of um, Chestnut Hills Gymnasium converted into the Media Center. Uh, one of the things I did want to point out is that every year when we got to a certain point, we'd take all the board members out and tour these schools. We scared them on a few, wondering if we were <laughs> going to get done, yes. But again, when they walked in and, you know, it was done. It was, it's just that's part of the magic of what we do. Two weeks before we're ready to turn it over, you're like, there's no way, and then you come back and it's done. This one here was very unique, um, which every school was. Every, every space we renovated had something unique, and here we were able to reclaim the parfait floors, and they did a great job of staining them, turning this all into uh, one of my favorite uh, spaces that we put together, only because we were able to use that wood floor. Not your standard every you know VCT uh, or carpet. This we utilized something that was there. Um, another large project that we worked on was the HVAC systems at Dow High. Um, we put 36 units in that building, and if it was just a matter of picking it off the roof and putting another one on, that would have been something we could have done in one year. All of these were, we had to take the louvers out of the walls, take all of them out in pieces, and then each component came back in in approximately seven to eight pieces to put one unit back in, and then all of the piping. So we split it up into two summers uh, due to codes where you have to have the air handlers have to be running for school. So we did this in two years. And um, the first year, you know, had its bumps. The second year had a little bit too much water, uh, <laughs> but we got through all of that and we were very successful. And, and again, everything so unique here in Midland, which to me makes it even more interesting to do. It's typically you just set them on the roof and these all in and out, cross the roof and through holes. <laughs> Um, also throughout, not just the one summer, we did an extreme amount of asphalt at both high schools and at Adams, but totally um, taking out asphalt and concrete, we did over a million square feet in this time. Um, not necessarily unique, but we did run into some fairly unsuitable soils in Midland, believe it or not. Um, but again, this is just what we do, and you have a lot of improved uh, bus drop-offs, a lot of um, car drop-offs. You know, we did a lot of separations and made it a lot safer. Um, another really nice accomplishment was your media centers at the middle schools and at the high schools. Um, that summer we went in and gutted these things all out and um, we put them all back together. And when we got all done, what I really enjoyed was every school I walked into before this year was packed. They all loved those spaces. Those students are in there, they're, they're studying, they they're just seem to enjoy it because it's so inviting. And I know that you've received some recognition for these media centers too. So great design, uh, great space, and really, happy to see the books. So. Another very large project uh, was the science labs and the chemistry labs <laughs> at the high school. Um, so this one, I mean, you go in and you demo these out and then you have to put it all back together. We did find some unique situations in here. They actually still had lead piping for plumbing, which oh. is way out there, <laughs> long, long time ago. And of course, like asbestos, it costs us money to get rid of it. 
So all of the plumbing has changed, all of the fixtures, countertops, casework, it, they are just absolutely beautiful. New chemical storage rooms, all connected to um, proper cabinets, proper ventilation. Um, this was a home run. Beautiful, beautiful labs. Um, also here in, in 2019, and uh, we're finishing this up now, we did the uh, wireless upgrades. So we went in and every um, wireless access, accent, access point, I'm sorry, I'm going to blame the mask, <laughs> um, was changed out. And then what you're seeing here is there's approximately five closets per school that are all have all the switches and everything that runs the data in here. Uh, we completely gutted them out. And as you can see on the left, that's what they used to look like. And now on the right is what they've done after they cleaned them up. So this is going to help with the maintenance, troubleshooting, everything. You know, everything's neat now and a lot easier to take care of. Um, it also, it, your technology here now is just top notch because everything has been sw has changed out. Um, this um, 20, uh, February 2020, we turned over the last elementary school's uh, addition at Adams. Um, so, you know, we have 50 some thousand square foot of additions we put on just the elementaries alone. One of the big things here um, that I'd like to point out is that each one of them got new serving lines and new kitchens. And I hear nothing but good news out of that. Uh, hot lunches, it's quicker now, a lot easier to control, and they're just, everybody's happy. The cooks are happy, the kids are happy. We can't do any better than that. Um, we also have completed this last summer was the last of the controls at Dow High in all 36 units. Uh, this picture is kind of a representation of all of the components, piping, electrical, controls everything in that it takes to get there. But now you're fully functioning. Um, nothing, um, talking with Mike Mogenberg, everything's working very well. And usually we have something to tweak. We have not had that problem here. Everything is working very well. Um, the stadium, uh, this one here kind of speaks for itself too. Um, we we um, redid the turf here this summer and we resurfaced the track again. Uh, the contractor came in, did a fantastic job resurfacing. We also added a parking lot uh, for the over by the ball diamonds for the extra parking that we get at your famous game that happens once a year. Uh, you also got a new press box. Um, right now we do have out to bid the bleacher replacement for the home side and turning the uh, visitor side into ADA uh, requirements fixing those. That is out the bid as we speak. Dow High um, landscape project. Uh, this is probably one of the nicest looking improvements from what we had. Um, when I first walked the state of Michigan in for an inspection at Dow High to look at the secured entrance, he stopped me the state and said, you will fix this concrete. <laughs> so this was, um, I, I love the design. I think French did a great uh, job with the design. Now we've only got two sets of stairs to maintain and still meet all the egress. We also uh, fixed all the EFAS around the entire building and repainted it. And the entire building now has high efficiency windows and doors, which is huge. Uh, the, you could feel the wind through those before. Now we have low E glass, thermally broken uh, frame, so everything is now energy efficient there. Okay, over to the middle schools. Um, this summer we did uh, some gym renovations. Uh, the big one uh, for Jefferson was they got rid of the old wooden bleachers that took several people to open and close. Uh, the new ones now are, are just like Northeast where they're aluminum and the plastic, all motorized and work fantastic. Refinished the floors, new wall pads, and new backstops throughout. And we also, for safety, we recertified all of the backdrops because they're still, they were very old, and now we, we've got to ensure that they're very safe to operate. Um, also, this last summer at the middle schools, um, we enhanced all the front of classrooms. 
This is also something we're doing this year with the high schools. Um, as you can see in the picture here, we, we've taken the front of classroom, we put in a new whiteboard and tack boards where we're replacing chalkboards. We also put in new projectors and sound systems enhancing so they don't have to yell at the students, they can talk to the students. Uh, which everything, um, I've heard no complaints on them. I think everybody's enjoying that great improvement for the classrooms. Some, Rick has a way of making that sound easier than it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to just kind of go through some high-level stuff, some summaries, and just some points of pride um, on the project. So, so far to date, we've completed $86 million plus dollars in projects. That little round circle on the bottom was kind of tallying that up through time, showing the percent complete. And we're 80% complete with all Series 1 and Series 2 projects. Um, all $73 million in Series 1 construction projects are complete. And as I go through these slides, you'll see at the bottom that it says to visit the website. Um, we've got a full listing of all this information, projects that were completed. Again, going back to 2014, those lists are listed there, identifying all the work that's been done, right down to the individual projects. Um, we've contracted with over, we've completed over 100 contracts to 60 different contractors with nearly 90% local participation. Um, you know, this was a big goal of the district. Under Mike Sherrill's leadership and Brad Blazy's, uh, Mr. Blazy's, you know, this was a, 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 an area in which from the day one that we got out here, you know, we were basically told we've got to increase the participation of the local contractors. And, you know, we're very happy with, you know, the percentages that we've been able to attain. That other 10% in most cases would have been um, like unique contractors. So, for example, a, a track contractor, a track surface, those types of things. So, We've had a lot, of a lot of participation and a lot of, you can see by 100 contracts with 60 contractors, we had a lot of repeat contractors as well. You know, that meant that they were coming to a job they thought was well organized, they were being paid at the appropriate times, and so we're, we're very proud of those numbers. So what's new? Uh, we completed $30 million and 120,000 square feet of new school facilities since 2015. The district completed the first ground up STEM theme elementary school and over 55,000 square feet in additions. Um, as Rick mentioned, those additions, excuse me, those additions um, freed up space additionally inside the building so they were able to, you know, expand those opportunities with maker spaces, um, STEM spaces. So those additions were more than just the additions that they, that they were designed for. Renovations, $50 million plus dollars in renovations have been completed since 2015. Um, so we got a big list here. Every elementary school has seen it, over $6 million in renovations. The middle schools have received over $5 million thus far. Both the middle schools and the high schools still have significant work to go. The high schools have received over $12 million in completed projects. Central Auditorium has received over $4.5 million in improvements. Over 220 new mechanical units and 18 boilers have been replaced district-wide. I mean, what an investment that is, I mean, for the next 20 years to have, you know, that level of equipment replaced. So, you know, Mike's, you can tell by his comments on his car, he's an infrastructure guy. So, you know, <laughs> making sure we identify those. And you'll see in the, um, you know, some of the additional projects, you know, this was, you know, what was in the bond wasn't enough. We did more as well. Over a million square feet of asphalt and concrete have been replaced. Much of that has been full depth replacement, so not just resurfacing. I mean, right down to the subgrade. Over 450,000 square feet of flooring has been installed since 2015. District-wide access control, video surveillance, and PA systems have been installed. Um, really a, a huge benefit to have those installed district-wide. Districts don't often have the opportunity to replace everything that's been done on several of these projects. So that's that consistency in systems and softwares that, you know, just increases Dave's ability to manage those systems. Over 10,900 staff and student devices have been image deployed and maintained. Most of that work, again, falls to Dave and his staff. Classroom technology has been completed in over 280 classrooms, including projectors and sound enhancement systems. The balance of those will happen this summer, so all of the classrooms in the, in the district will eventually receive new classroom technology. The district's network and wireless infrastructure have been upgraded, has replaced 65 passenger, or excuse me, four 65 passenger lift buses and 11 77 passenger lift buses, passenger buses. 
So what projects, what additional projects have been done? So we've completed over $10 million in additional projects. And again, you can see a full listing of these on the district's website. But that original, what was originally in the bond program was to build the new Central Park Elementary. The STEM theme version of that was an additional project. So there was a lot of additional investment into that building to create that. Woodcrest STEM Classroom Edition, over $2 million in additional mechanical equipment an additional million dollars improvements at the Central Auditorium. So as we went through those planning sessions, there was like a strong desire from, you know, that, that um, you know, from the auditorium folks that they really wanted to enhance some of the sound systems. And, um, and so we were able to put additional million dollars in there. And so Midland Public Schools as of today still has over $4 million in bid savings remaining to complete additional projects. So that list is only going to continue to grow. So what's still to come? There's still $18 million in project and work yet to be completed. Uh, we mentioned the Midland Stadium bleacher replacement project, additional mechanical and controls. The district will also have a district-wide um, building management system, controls, again, which is just another tool that's just fantastic for the district to not only save money, which is important, but also the comfort in the classroom too, which is equally important. And so having that resource and Mr. Mogaberg and his ability to manage the, uh, all that new equipment. High school classroom technology, additional flooring, interior doors, windows, and architectural components. A lot of select replacements through the high schools yet to come. Gym renovations at Midland High School. Restroom renovations throughout the district. District-wide phone system. And that's, you know, to name a few. And Series 3 is yet to be sold, which will be sold in 2023. And that will generate an additional $8 million in revenue for additional projects, tech equipment, and bus purchases. And that's our summary. With that, if anybody's got any questions, we'd love to answer some questions. We've spent a lot of time out there on those projects. We'll be happy to share any more, you know, any more information or experience we've had. I don't have any questions, but it was um, uh, wonderful as board members to be able to walk through with you guys and see the construction as it was, as our buildings were getting revamped. And... Um, and see the quality and, and workmanship that went into our building. So appreciate all the hard work, and it sure is exciting to see it all together. Absolutely. Um, yeah, looking back, it doesn't seem like very long ago that we passed that bond, and then to look at all of the things we've accomplished since then is just uh, wonderful for our community. Yeah. yeah I, I'm, I'm just as excited, having seen this from start, to where we are now has just been uh, kind of a tremendous evolution that we've gone through. And you guys have been, I think, on top of it. And, and you've been an absolute pleasure, at least from a board member's standpoint, from my standpoint, to work with. Um, I felt very informed the entire way. I didn't feel at all like we were ever lagging behind or not getting top value for our dollar. Um, I mean, geez, $10 million in extra projects, that just shows um, how well you guys have done managing this and, and saving money for our taxpayers, which is tremendously important to all of us up here. Uh, and we still have $4 million in savings to figure out what to do with, and we'll certainly put it to good use. But uh, guys, absolutely fantastic job. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I'll, uh, I'll take the gratitude, but most of that you know, falls on you know, Mike Sherrill's you know, leadership and the FFO committee. Um, in a lot of ways, we couldn't be as successful as we feel we've been um, you know, without you guys. So. Yeah, much appreciated, though. Anybody else? Okay. Mike has a knack for saving money. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Was there any okay. issue, Daryl, with uh, when you had to disassemble the rooftop units? Because typically, if you have to take a, a packaged unit apart into seven pieces that's brand new, that manufacturer is going to have some heartburn. So those were designed to come in pieces. Okay. Um, so they, they weren't packaged equipment. So the air handle equipment, um, the engineer spent a lot of time out there looking. And I, I wish the pictures could do justice how tight some of those quarters are. So if we're taking out 20 units, you've got to put, you know, the first one in and then bring the second one in and bring the third one in. And you've got to bring those in and assemble those in pieces. And then you have to pipe it and sheet metal it in a rotation that guys aren't all on top of each other. So a lot of thought by the engineers up front to make sure all that equipment fit. Um, you know, we've been fortunate enough 
um, you know, to have a, a great team of engineers as well as some of the support from the, some of the suppliers working with the engineers to assure that all that fit the way it did. Carol mentioned we, um, 23 were designed to be placed or 21 and off on that number. Then we added with savings, all of them, yeah. did it over two years. We also purchased equipment all in one year, um, figuring there would be possible escalation in the price into the second year we were able to store them and, and keep them in. So it really was... Rick went through it quickly, but it might have been one of the more difficult projects on, on all moves on today. Yeah, lost a lot of sleep that first summer coming into the start of school. I mean, just the complexity of getting all that in there, piping it. I mean, the, the contractors, you know, you get to a point where you've been working in that tunnel for two and a half months trying to get that in, and it gets, it gets you know, it's complicated. So hats off to those guys for pulling it off. In a lot of ways, we, you know, we do the upfront planning and set the table for them. Uh -huh, but they have to deliver. So, um, but to Mike's point, that two million dollars in additional mechanical equipment we referenced was was for the most part the Dow High equipment, um, which, you know, going back in at some point later after we've done it, probably would have been a bad idea. So the kind of the original thought of just hand picking the worst ones. Um, so fortunate we were fortunate to have the savings to go in and tackle all of them at once. Another round of them in Midland High for this summer. <laughs> but we don't have to go across the room. Yeah. Well done. Yes. Thank yep. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. I think we're ready to go back to Jennifer's service. So. All right. Thanks. Jennifer, are you with us? And just for the record, we're moving back to item 3.1. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Are we good? All right. Awesome. I'm on the phone, but thank you for your patience with technology. <laughs> Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Can you now see early literacy at MPS? Yes. 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 Uh, that this was a really telling picture to capture early literacy in M MPS during a pandemic. So <laughs> draw your attention to our image on the first slide. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having us tonight. My name is Jen Service, and I am the Elementary Curriculum and Instructional Specialist for MPS. I am joined tonight by our amazing early literacy specialist team, Shannon Panasic, Kim Welter, Annalisa Christensen, and Trisha Clancy. We are here to share a sneak peek into early literacy within MPS. Our literacy specialists will share information on the MDE Early Literacy Essential, coaching, curriculum implementation, the read by grade three law, and their work around meeting individual student needs. I would like to begin tonight by asking you to take a few minutes to reflect. I ask that you think about yourself as a reader and a writer. What is your earliest memory of being a reader and a writer? And finally, how do you use literacy skills in your day-to-day -day life, both personally and professionally? As you know, literacy is so much a part of who we are, how we function, and how we navigate and succeed in our day-to-day -day duties and responsibilities. Our collective mission tonight is to convey our MPS literacy mission to you. All students will become literate and have essential skills to be successful. To begin our presentation, I would like to introduce you first to Annalisa Christensen, our literacy specialist at Central Park the Pre-Primary Center, and Plymouth Elementary. Thank you, Jen. The K-3 Early Literacy Essentials are one component along with coaching and curriculum implementation that help strengthen core instruction for all students. All of us want children throughout Michigan to be successful. An important part of student success centers around proficiency in reading. That's why a group of education experts developed new approaches for teachers to use in the classroom. 
This group of education experts created the Literacy Essentials. Literacy Essentials are documents designed for Michigan educators to improve childhood literacy development. The Literacy Essentials provide research-proven, effective approaches to markedly improve literacy skills. Using the Literacy Essentials with every child in every classroom they will help improve literacy among our youngest learners. They include 10 research-based practices that if they are implemented every day, will have a positive impact on literacy development. They should be used to guide instructional practices in the elementary classroom. I would like to introduce Tricia Clancy, who is going to talk about coaching in the elementary classroom. Thank you, Annalisa. In middle public schools, we support teachers in implementing the essential practices that Annalisa referred to through coaching. Coaching is job-embedded professional development that has a significant impact on teacher practice. One analysis of 60 studies shows that coaching has a larger impact on teacher practice than the difference between novice teachers and veteran teachers. In Midland Public Schools, all teachers will receive coaching, including the teachers teaching in our virtual academy, because all teachers deserve high-quality, job-embedded professional development. Most often, this professional development is delivered through coaching cycle. To begin a coaching cycle, the teachers, the principal, and the coach analyze student achievement data. From that data, they set a student achievement goal. Let me give you an example. Perhaps in one building, the third grade students need to improve their ability to make inferences from fictional text. When set, set as a, an achievement goal, the coach then provides professional development around the essential practices that will help improve that area of literacy. Once they provide the professional development, they also go into the classroom. Depending on the teacher's expertise, they may model the implementation of those practices, or they may simply observe the teacher as they implement the practices and provide feedback. The teacher and the coaches work together until the teacher's practices have shifted and the uh, student achievement shows that progress has been made. Then the coaches move on to work with another set of teachers around another literacy goal. Through effective coaching cycles, we are building capacity in our teachers and strengthening our core instruction. Here to talk about another way we strengthen core instruction is Shannon Panasic. Thanks, Trisha. Another way that we strengthen uh, core instruction is through curriculum implementation. One of the areas that we are focusing on is our upcoming implementation of the units of study. We are excited that these units of study will provide us with a consistent approach for research-based best practices throughout the district. The workshop approach that is used in the units is aligned with the essential literacy practices. These units are based on years of research and are constantly revised to keep current with changing understandings of how children learn. To give you a little information on the timeline of this project, there was a major change proposal approved in the 2019-2020 school year. This year, however, things were put on hold due to the pandemic. The literacy team still attended a week-long conference over the summer on the writing units of study. This opportunity provided us with additional knowledge to help support our teachers with the upcoming implementation process. Next school year, we plan on implementing the writing units of study, and then the following year, we will move on to implementing the reading and phonics units of study. Not only do we strengthen core instruction that impacts all of our students, we also work to meet individual needs. We do this in several ways. The Read Grade 3 law and the creation of the individual reading improvement plans are both driven by data. Midland Public Schools adopted MWEA as our initial screener assessment this year. This was an assessment tool that was on the approved list created by the Michigan Department of Education, which replaced the use of DIBBLE. 
This assessment has allowed us to gather data on all of our students. The data gives us the ability to make instructional decisions that are best for our students and differentiate our instruction to target the learners. Next, Gen Service will share information about the Read by Grade 3 law. Thanks, Shannon. In 2016, the Michigan Legislature passed the Read by Grade 3 law, Public Act 306. The purpose of this law is to ensure that all students exiting third grade are at or above grade level proficiency. This law also ensures extra support for K-3 students who are not reading at grade level. We know that students need strong reading skills to support their learning in all core subject areas. This is truly a partnership between teachers, students, the school community, and families. We encourage families to read at home with their children, to retell favorite stories, to ask questions, and to encourage their children to write about what they have read. Information about the Read by Grade 3 law has been shared in multiple ways with our MPS families. Elementary building principals sent a district letter home to third grade families on Friday, November 6th. We shared information in the November 9th communique, which included links to meals for families, as well as tips for helping at home. And all of our DK through third grade classroom teachers shared information with families at the elementary parent-teacher conferences on November 11th. We know that together, teachers and families can ensure that all of our young learners achieve reading success. And finally tonight, I would like to turn it over to Kim Welter, our literacy specialist at Woodcrest and Chestnut Hill, to share the individual reading improvement plan timeline, more commonly referred to as the IRIP. Thank you, Jen. As Jen stated, I'm going to talk about the um, individualized reading improvement plan. The first thing we do is we begin with assessment and, and identifying the students. We then create the plan and meet with the parents and the plan is implemented. We assess all K-3 students three times per year with our benchmark assessment in effort to identify struggling readers or who are sometimes referred to as our striving readers and writers. Midland Public Schools uses NWEA percentage scores as the initial screener along with a Developmental Reading Assessment, or DRA, to dig deeper for more information into what is going on with the reader. We are required by law to have an Individual Reading Improvement Plan, or IRIS, created within 30 days of the testing period. This plan is created in partnership with the student's teacher, the literacy specialist, the resource room teacher if needed, the principal, and the families of the students. The plan includes data from testing, the instructional plan including specific interventions and strategies that match the need of the child, along with the frequency and duration for the intervention or strategy. These students are also progress monitored weekly to ensure the effectiveness of the intervention. Another very important part of the plan is the read at home section. Families are provided with extended learning opportunities to strengthen their students' reading skills. This is in addition to the instruction and interventions that are being done at school. Once the plan has been created, the teacher meets with the family to go over and discuss the plan in the fall, after the plan has been created, and at the conclusion of the school year. The plan is updated with each benchmark assessment. We also continue to monitor these students well beyond the years that follow, even beyond the third grade. I also want to point out that we do place students on a reading plan in January if they are showing need at that time. So it is possible for a student not to have a reading plan in the fall, but then to have one created in January based on the data that's presented to us, collected, and reviewed during our data meetings. As we've stated throughout our presentation, creating this plan is a collaborative effort between the literacy team and the families. The reading improvement plans are student-focused and individualized to meet the needs of the students with research-based interventions and strategies. It is important to remember that this is a process and a document won't make a child a better reader or writer, but it will enable us to collaborate with one another 
and with the families to ensure that their child is literate. This takes us to our next slide, which is a quote from Lucy Hawkins. To teach well, we do not need more techniques and strategies as much as we need a vision of what is essential. This ties everything we have presented together. The essential practices guide what we must teach, and we have to be intentional to meet the needs of all of our students, especially our striving readers and writers. To re reiterate our NPS mission, all students will become literate and have essential skills to be successful. Thank you very much for listening, and now we are going to take comments and questions. I have a question. So um, the summer writing units of study that you, that you participated in over the summer, after going to that, what do you expect to see or what are some of the outcomes that you're seeing from that? So I'll start with that, Pam. One of the things that we really found beneficial from attending that conference was really um, we heard from teachers from all over the world that have implemented these units and really talked through the strategy of implementation and that sometimes that less is more um, because these units are pretty comprehensive, um, include a lot of information, and at times could tend to be overwhelming. So we really had the opportunity to ask a lot of questions about the how and why of implementing and the support needed um, through professional development from our teachers, which they said is the most valuable piece. Um, we'll have trainers coming in um, at the beginning of the year and mid-year, and then we'll be able to then continue support with our literacy specialists who will have also received the training to really be hands-on and really be able to coach in the classroom to support teachers with the rollout. So that's what I would say, that we were really given guidance on how to roll them out and how to really support teachers throughout that. Excellent. Jen, I have a question. Anybody else? Oh. Want to speak to that? Oh, you're good. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, and, and anybody can answer this. Uh, given our, our current educational environment, what adaptations are being made or implemented to ensure that the read by grade three uh, requirement is met, and how are the IRIPs um, being adapted to fit uh, a virtual environment versus an in, a face to face environment? Hold on one second, we're going to switch places. <laughs> Um, well, one thing we've done is obviously with our virtual teachers, um, we've met with them virtually, we've met with the parents virtually if they were doing um, virtual conferences and shared the IRIS that way. Um, we also meet with the virtual teachers to make sure that their interventions and strategies are being um, delivered the way that they're supposed to and with fidelity and according to what the, the, um, the reading plan states. So it's been a collaborative effort for sure this year. It's been a lot different than what we've experienced in the past. But we are doing our best to get everything met at this time. Does anyone else have anything to say about that? No? I think that's, that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. I have one more question. Of course. Um, you talked about reading and phonics being the focus for next year. So the summer writing units of study was this past summer. Next year we'll be reading and phonics. Is, there, is that kind of a shift in what we're doing? Um, so this coming year, um, next school year will be writing, and then the year after that, reading and phonics. Um, it's a slight shift. It's not a huge shift. Um, in that we're still teaching the um, children how you know how to read, how to write, and I think that the biggest change with the Lucy Hawkins unit is how um, integrated all those subjects are together. So that children aren't losing, really learning things in isolation. If they take if they learn something in isolation, immediately it's put back into the context of reading and writing. So um, it really helps the children transfer anything that they learn in isolation to that process of reading and writing. And I think that's really one of the biggest strengths of we can call kids units and study. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you for doing such a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And they, and they adapted very quickly to technology. They're not working, so great job. <laughs>
Okay, that puts us at 3.3, .3, Shining Stars. Mr. Sherrill. We have our two Shining Stars for November, and the first one is Jamie, hopefully I say this right, Hereska. Uh, Jamie has been part of the MPS <clears throat> team for 10 years before coming to MPS. She was a special education teacher at the Grass Lake Community Schools in Clinton County, Risa. Jamie joined the MPS team in 2010 as a special education teacher at H.H. Dow High. Jamie's 10 years with MPS have all been spent teaching Dow High Chargers. In addition to teaching, she also has been a, a class sponsor as well as girls track and field coach. Jamie joined, earned both her bachelor's and master's degrees from Grand Valley State University. Ms. Hereska was nominated by the MPS student and colleagues. Among their comments were the following. Jamie goes above and beyond for our department in creating helpful tools for teachers and students. She creates training videos when teachers are not available to meet in person, tracking forms, and is willing to sit down in person to help on, on our own team. Jamie has been an incredible help to our department in providing meetings to assist colleagues in, com in completing mandated forms during the shutdown, as well as providing hours of assistance in helping many of us develop our Canvas classrooms and all of the intricacies involved with that. Those texts take so much time, <clears throat> are so well done, and are so helpful. She does it for the, out of the loyalty for the school, the teachers, administrators, parents, and especially our special needs students. She goes above and beyond by letting us hang out in her classroom after school every day and get our work done. If you have homework questions, she tries her hardest to help with them. Overall, she always goes above and beyond and always has a positive attitude that she brings every day to school with a smile. Congratulations, <laughs> Jamie. Our second shining star is Kimberly Crump. Kimberly joined the MPS team in 2019 as a sign language interpreter at Seabird Elementary School. She holds her interpreter certification from the state of Michigan. Kimberly was nominated for a shining star by a Seabird parent. Among their comments were the following. Not only does Kim interpret for my child, she seeks to, to make sure he's understood and desires to see him succeed. She is creating curriculum to help him increase his American Sign Language knowledge. Kim will take the time to communicate with us if there are concerns and also when there are victories. She helps him to navigate both the hearing and the deaf culture. Kim goes well beyond expectations to see our son excel. We are grateful for her and her work with our son. Congratulations, Kimberly. Nice. Okay. All right, thanks, Mike. Okay, that brings us to uh, item number four, request to address the board. Before we get into our guests who are patiently waiting, um, if you guys could just indulge me for a couple minutes while I give you a bit of a DEI update as of uh, November 16th, 2020. Um, so I'm just gonna read this, this kind of summary to bring everybody up to speed as to where the district is at and what's been done in light of um, our educational environment with the pandemic and the, the almost day-to-day -day changes that, that we're going through. Uh, so here we go. The commitment to transform to an anti-racist district requires a dual focus on individual introspection, learning, reflection, and growth, coupled with the structural and cultural changes that must occur organizationally. The DEI strategy and current work aligns with this dual focus. The information that I'm going to read is a high-level summary of what's currently underway in the district. All teachers have engaged in DEI-centered professional learning during every PD so far this year, PD Professional Development Day, uh, and this is planned for the remaining PD days. Some schools have extended the learning with their school PD time. There's a relaunch active alley program in all schools, increasing the likelihood of reporting DEI-related matters and increasing student support. The following action teams have launched and are engaged in their plan of work. Restorative practices offer a deeper, more consistent implementation across the district. Adoption of new curriculum materials are revised processes within the lenses of DEI. Review of current curriculum materials. This is a use of a process and tool to uncover current pieces that require reconsideration. Human resource recruitment processes. Development of a perception survey. DEI skill sets for student family curriculum development. 
the development of the new continuous improvement process and the multi-tiered system of support framework has all been done with equity as its cornerstone. Every school leader has completed an inclusive leadership learning and coaching experience and completed the White Fragility book study. Each school has initial plans for the development of a DEI staff team for actions at the school level. Some schools have already launched their team. Currently working with principals to identify two to three staff per school to receive training and serve in DEI leadership capacities for future activities. DEI is a standing agenda item at every Board of Education committee meeting. We are currently in the initial development phase of an equity audit framework. So guys, that's kind of where we're at in terms of what we've accomplished since August, right? Is that when we, we adopted the, the proclamation? Yes. Um, I think we've, we've made some good strides. Certainly we're, we're not done and we've got a lot of work to do. Um, but I'm very proud of, of what we've accomplished and what the administrative team has accomplished so far. You guys have, have really done well. Uh, so all of that said, we're going to move into our request to address the board. We have with us tonight uh, Bruce Race and Fred Honorkamp. Honorkamp or Hornerkamp? I, I'm not... Uh, Honorkamp. Honorkamp, Honor. okay. Um, gentlemen, you have the floor. Okay, can you hear me? We sure can. Yes. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm sorry? Thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you. It's our pleasure. Uh, as mentioned, I am Bruce Race. I'm the president of the Kawasi Kiwanis Foundation. And as you might guess, we're associated with the Kiwanis Club of the same name, one of two Kiwanis Clubs here in Midland. With me tonight are some of our foundation board members. Dwayne Townley, Vice President. Gordon Rogers, Secretary. Alex Rapanis, Treasurer. And Fred Honorcat, Project Director for our Chromebook Replacement Project. As I was sitting here, it came to me that two members of our foundation board have spouses who at one time sat where you're sitting tonight. <laughs> Terry Townley, the wife of Vice President Wayne Townley, served as a member of the Board of Education, and did, as did Nan Scotchtapol, wife of Dick Scotchtapol, who's mm -hmm. a member of our board. Qantas, as you probably know, is an international service organization with the motto of improving the world one community and one child at a time. So much of what we do, both as a club and as a foundation, is focused on helping kids. So much for the commercial. <laughs> on May 12th, Superintendent Sharrow was the guest speaker at our weekly Kiwanis Club. At that time, he shared with us the logistical and financial challenges of educating our kids under the constraints and pressures of COVID-19. One of the several things that were, became very apparent to us that night was the absolute dependence, the dependence of the middle public schools upon Chromebooks in order to provide virtual learning. Exactly one week later, the floods came. Soon after, our foundation got together to discuss what, if anything, we could do to address some of the problems and losses from the floods. We talked with Captain Brian Goodwill at the, Farn at the Salvation Army, who's a member of our club. We talked about replacing bicycles that had been washed away. We talked about repair, repair, replacing a number of things. And then someone said, why don't we talk to Superintendent Sherrill? So we did. We called Mike's office, sat down with him. And it's then and there that we became aware that 250 Chromebooks had been lost in the floods at an estimated cost of $70,000. We got back together and discussed various ways we could help. Frankly, we'd never taken on a project this large, and we knew that if, if we would, we would only be able to provide a portion of the amount, and thus we'd have to reach out to the community. We'd have to ask others to pitch in to help us. And we'd be doing so at a time when we were, we were keenly aware that there were many, many, many needs in Midland at that time, all requiring financial support from the community. Could we succeed? Now, frankly, we were scared. We didn't want to uh, fail, but determined, but apprehensive, we decided to press ahead. 
We named Fred Honorcap to act as a project director as he's been an early supporter of the Chromebook idea. Each member of the board assumed a very specific role. I was going to do this, Fred was going to do that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Fred met with, with Sharon Mortensen at the Woodland Area Community Foundation and we decided to establish the fund there. We kicked it off in that very room where you're sitting tonight with a donation from our foundation of $10,000. Followed up quickly by additional donations from our Michigan Kiwanis Children's Fund and from the Midland Evening Kiwanis Clubs Foundation. And the fund began to grow. We then reached out to other foundations, other clubs, churches, businesses, friends, neighbors, anyone we could talk to. And the fund continued to grow. We quickly began to see what can happen. What can happen when there is a good cause and a good community that pulls together to address it. I guess I'll stop here. I'm, I'm stealing Fred's thunder, but before I do so, let me sit and make a couple more comments. We're here tonight to celebrate what for us has been a heartwarming example of community collaboration. I'll leave don't be mistaken, we are very proud to have initiated this project. We are absolutely thrilled by the way the community has supported it. So, thanks to many, I'm happy to announce tonight we're ready to issue a check for $70,000. <laughs> as we understand, the Chromebooks are just now beginning to arrive. And now, let me introduce our project director, our team quarterback, Fred Honor. <laughs> Thank you. It's been an honor working. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I'm humbled when I, I listened to the school infrastructure bond report and they were talking millions and millions. <laughs> when Bruce said, this is a big project for us, we normally are in the $1,000, $2,000 range. To take on something like $70,000 was just something beyond our horizon. We got a lot of help from uh, Sharon Mortensen and Emily Schaefer at the foundation, at the Midland Area Community Foundation. But we also had help from, from little people, big and, big and wide. For example, uh, uh, John and Jennifer went. Uh, they were flooded out by the flood, and yet their moral and financial support kicked us off. Um, we had people that were the town lead, I think we, we mentioned Terry and Dwayne earlier, they rallied the retired school community, superintendents and teachers alike, to pitch in whatever they could, either in time, talent, or in contributions. We had uh, a friend of mine in Baltimore sent us a check. Uh, the Santa School graduates who love Midland <laughs> sent in checks. We have checks from around the country to help support the children of Midland. I am proud of the fact that we've raised $70,000 for our 250 Chromebooks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cut. Absolutely. I am just... Um, Honored that you came out to the board meeting tonight and shared the story with us. Often we see, you know, a bullet point in our uh, board agenda, but tonight we had the honor of hearing about the story and how you work together to bring this to our schools. And we are deeply grateful and honored to uh, receive this wonderful gift. It just really means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very heartwarming. Uh, Bruce and Fred, thank you both. We really, we words are are insufficient. I think at this point, um, but you're impacting 250 kids, and that means the world to us as a board and to us as as administrators of this district. So, um, my hats off to you, and and we are uh, very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you. Um, we will move to our next guest. We have uh, Katie, Ka Stearns. Katie Stearns, anti-racist expectations at Midland High School and for the district. Katie, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Kiwanis Club. That is amazing. I wish I had $70,000 to <laughs> add to that, but thank you so much. That was pretty awesome. Uh, my name is Katie Stern. I reside at 4131 Cruise Drive in the Plymouth School neighborhood. I speak to you this evening as a proud 1989 graduate of Midland High School, a 24-year veteran social studies and English teacher at Midland High School, a parent of a current chemic, and the parent of a 2019 Midland High graduate. Science, math, social studies, English, art, accounting, building trades, marketing, band, choir, introduction to engineering, health and wellness, and computer technology. Hybrid, face-to-face, -face, virtual, and Canvas. Teachers are charged with presenting new information, perspectives, and empathy in a multitude of content areas in many different ways. It is our job, and we embrace it. Education and knowledge is challenging. Teachers are supposed to expand minds, push for creative, critical and creative thinking, and at times encourage students to think beyond what they know and beyond their own stories. In addition to content, we are asked to establish and protect diversity, inclusion, and equity in all classes, clubs, and activities, all while supporting and nurturing the social and emotional well-being of all of our students. With this, we must challenge and not accept bigotry, prejudice, and intolerance in our school or classrooms. Those go against the very fabric of education and educators. At Midland High School, we know we cannot eliminate racism, bigotry, and prejudice with one lesson or with one year of instruction. But what we can and will do is protect our students from both blatant and covert acts of hate speech, hate symbols, and harassment of any kind. Whether it is the Confederate flag or the newly commandeered white supremacist OK sign of white power, Midland High staff will not tolerate these acts or any other acts of hate speech in the walls of our school. If a student's family or friends choose to display those symbols or speak in such a matter outside the walls of Midland High, we can't necessarily stop it. Although it is my hope that through education, our students will not behave or display this bigotry outside of school. My hope is that education, tolerance, and anti-racism win outside the classrooms of Midland High. No matter how the district administration deals with the issue of racism, sexism, and harassment, I want to be clear that within the walls of Midland High School, open-mindedness, kindness, and respect is what will be tolerated, displayed, and celebrated. Education is meant to challenge and expand thinking in a variety of areas, and it starts with the willingness to hear other perspectives and evaluate your own thinking and beliefs. At Midland High, we will continue to provide emotional safety so all students can participate, question, learn, and be positive members of our school and larger community. When the emotional and mental safety of one student is compromised by the bigotry and prejudice of another, it is the duty of the teacher, the school, and the entire district to not only protect the student, but to educate the perpetrator on what is expected of being a chemic and a human, a human being. Bottom line, we will teach our content. Bottom line, we will challenge bigotry and hate speech. And bottom line, we will hold chemics and the districts accountable to our DEI proclamation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. We, we really appreciate your time tonight. And uh, we agree with you in that the yeah. DEI proclamation is a critical piece of our structure now. Uh, so I, I hear everything that you're saying and um, Thank you so much. It's very well received. Okay, um, Katie, thank you. Uh, before we get to our, our next speaker, I do want to say that the, the board, uh, just to remind everybody, we are, are here to listen. Um, we are listening to everything that you're saying, but we are not going to engage uh, our speakers tonight um, in any kind of active conversation. If there is a question for the board, uh, we will certainly get that information for you uh, by way of a, an official response. Uh, we just we don't know what may come up tonight, so it's hard to invite everybody to engage the board in conversation. So I hope you guys understand that, um, and we, we certainly appreciate that. So uh, with that being said, um, Stephanie Andresen, uh, are you with us? I think 
think she's on mute. Mm -hmm. I can't see. Can she call in, like, um... Send her a message, you want to repeat that, maybe she can hear you? Yes. Stephanie, we, we can't hear you. Um, your audio is apparently not working. Okay, hold on. Oh, well, you looked like it was off there for a second. Is it working now? Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. Okay, good. Okay. Stephanie, thank you for Great. joining. Okay. We appreciate you I'm being sorry. with us tonight. We appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for uh, letting me have a moment to speak. Um, I wanted to talk about COVID-19 and specifically the uh, upcoming due date for second semester selection for face-to-face -face hybrid or virtual enrollment. Um, what I have planned to talk about obviously has changed a little bit with the announcements that have come out uh, in the past couple of days with MPS's intention to go remote beginning next week and um, not return to school until January 18th. Um, and then, of course, the governor's announcement. Um, right now, I can tell you that I'm a parent of a sixth grade student at Northeast. She's currently in the hybrid program, and that was what we chose at the time, thinking that it would be the best option. And I can attest to um, the goal of MPS to keep students in face-to-face -face instruction. My daughter is currently doing very well in her in-person classes and struggling with the virtual portion. Um, we would like to have her return for face-to-face -face in second semester, but what isn't clear to me as a parent is what metrics or what thresholds we may have in place for determining if it's safe to do so. I don't know if we are looking at the positivity rate in our community, the quarantine rate at the schools, local hospital capacity, or if it's some culmination of all of those, I guess my concern is that we're making decisions now that are due in one week without being able to project where we're going to be at with the virus in two months from now. And I'd like to know that I can enroll my daughter in face-to-face, -face, but I'd also like to know that the school has a plan in place to go remote if the risk in the community at that time outweighs the benefit of face-to-face -face instruction. Um, so I guess the question that I'm posing, um, and someone can follow up with me after the meeting, is, I mean, do we have any specific criteria for that that is available to parents? I know there are a lot of us that are struggling with the decision for second semester, given where we're at right now and not knowing where we'll be in two months. Wanting our children to have that face-to-face -face option, but also wanting to know that if it's unsafe to do so, the MPS will intervene. So that was my primary question. And the other thing that I wanted to mention that I was um, interested about this is now that the Midland Health Department is going to be doing limited contact tracing, how will that affect Midland Public Schools when we do return to school in person, hopefully in mid-January? Okay. So I don't know if those are questions you can answer now or if someone wants to follow up after the meeting. Um, but those are the points that I wanted to present tonight. They are not questions that I can answer now, but Stephanie, as a, as a parent of four children in the district, I understand absolutely where you're coming from, uh, and I have some of the same concerns myself. So we will get you an answer uh, to those questions as soon as we can. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Okay, up next we have Mr. Uh, John Mulvaney. Are you with us, Mr. Mulvaney? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for joining Hi. us. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is John Mulvaney. I'm father of a current Chemic and one graduate. I have been a social studies teacher at Midland High for over 20 years, having instructed some of your children and one of you. I live at 735 South Ireland in Midland. <laughs> um, I'll send a copy of this document to the board and superintendent so you can access relevant links. I was inspired as I viewed the meetings the board had with Amy Beasley this summer and saw the hard work and heartfelt sincerity shown by the participants while discussing how MPS can maximize the goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our community. The unanimous acceptance of the new mission statement, working definitions, and proclamation and racism show positive steps toward realizing the board's mission to lead with respect, trust, and courage, ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture, and enable all to achieve success. It seems MPS has two distinct areas regarding DEI, BP before proclamation, and AP after proclamation. My concern is that sometimes it seems this document is more like a whisper than a proclamation. Many think they've heard something about it, but not sure if they even heard it at all or heard it right. The MPS strategies that include DEI spotlights in the UK and posting a position for a diversity director and many other things have form, but do they have function? It's like building a multi-million dollar house without new doors. It's nice to look at, but hard to use sometimes. I'm here to ask the board to confirm that the intent of all these strategies are to take real action and walk in the door of the DEI house, not just tap lightly against the wall of the tour. Teachers on the front lines of the classroom need your unwavering support if you're going to focus on the client's spirit and intent of the proclamation, not just worrying about what is defensible in a potential lawsuit. I'm also here to ask the community they support the board in enforcing this proclamation and everything within it. This is especially relevant in the light of President Trump's racial sensitivity executive order of September 22nd, banning the federal government and contractors from taking part in racial sensitivity training, and the fact that 56% of the county voted for the Trump Pence presidential ticket. If the majority of the community supports such an executive order, it's an open question if they can concurrently support the proclamation as written. Assuming continued support for the proclamation, I am presenting my interpretation of NPS policies and action plans for my classroom and at Midland High regarding DEI as outlined below. Despite the wide variety of current NPS DEI activities, as I always tell my own kids, we can always do better. NPS has taken some tangible steps away from systemic racism and specific racist incidents. But this is going to be a long race and the marathon has just begun. The most recent racist incident a few weeks ago has reminded many in the school community that we can always do better. And I would like to thank the superintendent for communicating with the staff by emailing 23 pages of relevant documents on October 29th. I also studied the three pages of the proclamation and three more of the DEI working definitions. Even more clarity may be provided from the 29 subsections of board policies available on the MPS website. I've attached a link in my document for convenience. As helpful as all these documents may be, I imagine it can be overwhelming to apply them effectively during the day-to-day -day running of school. In the superintendent's all-staff memo from October 29th, it states that despite these discussions that have occurred regarding that most recent incident, where some believe NPS has backed down on this statement, the proclamation, we have not. We view the symbol as presently harmful to our learning environment and the individuals involved understand that it's not allowed in NPS. The statement seems to, to, to adjust that not backing up is defined as no longer aligned similar MPS, ensuring the offending party knows this to be the case. If this is accurate, would backing down be described only as allowing the individual or others to wear the offending symbol? I don't know the answer to that question, but what I'm saying is I think we can do better in the future. It's my opinion that the action in this case does not contribute to the psychological safety of school community members, nor rewards vulnerability without fear of being embarrassed or punished. On the contrary, it seems to have a tone of defense minimization. As you can see, I paid attention to the PD video on November 3rd and encourage you to also view Dr. Murray's presentation if you have it. In Board Policy PO5517, it states, all share responsibility for avoiding, discouraging, and reporting any form of unlawful harassment. And the school district community are encouraged to promptly report incidents of harassing conduct to a teacher or administrator so that the board may address the conduct before it becomes severe, pervasive, or persistent. So I'm accepting this call to action as I believe over the last few years, this conduct has become severe, pervasive, and persistent, possibly leading to a sort of conflict trauma for the district. I will not list the incidents here. They can be easily reviewed by doing a Google search of NPS racist incident, though some do not show up in public because they were dealt with internally or informally. The regularity of these incidents has resulted in NPS pledging 
to be hypervigilant in viewing social media posts, symbols, and written verbal communication for any signs of racial harassment. As I have said, positive steps have been taken, but I believe we can always do better. One way to do so is to be proactive when sadly the next incident might occur. Using the documents listed in the reference section, I've created a table highlighting MPS stated goals of context, current action plans, policies, and how to do better. I plan to share this regularly with all stakeholders at MHS with the goal of changing the system, eliminating racism, and creating a more equitable and inclusive school for all. I am not an expert in any of this. I'm not a lawyer who can parse the legal letter, the law, or policy. But I believe I understand the spirit of the proclamation and racism and MPS's new mission statement. And I'm sure I understand the intent of many of my former and current students who made up a majority of the petitioners and marchers who have been calling for MPS to do better regarding DEI. I ask that you please advise me if any of the definitions or policies below are incorrect or if any of the actions to get better or counters any board policy or intent. If this is the case, I may have misinterpreted the documents. Please educate me by referencing specific lines within industry policies and guidelines, as I have done in the table below. If I do not hear anything, I will assume everything is accurate and actionable. Some may say that now is not the right time to focus on DEI. We're in the middle of a pandemic to focus on just keeping the schools open and the school community safe. Perhaps, but there's always going to be something, and until racial equality is purposely put on the top of the list, it won't be. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of the fierce urgency of now and warned of the tranquilizing drug of gradualism in 1963. That was over five decades ago. So, the plans for action listed below are a direct result of my study of the documents listed in the reference section. I believe these actions would help us to do better. My intent is to apply these actions within my classroom and encourage my colleagues in building leadership to do the same throughout MHS. A, use the formal complaint procedure for any incident that is or may be racial harassment to ensure full investigation and record keeping to maximize transparency and public accountability. B, when using restorative practices, focus on restoring justice to the victim of any racial harassment, along with the wider school community, not just restoring the perpetrator. C, develop more numerous and improved educational opportunities for staff with the goal of teaching how to recognize and deal with racial harassment using mandated contractual or PD time as much as possible to maximize staff attendance. D, communicate regularly and deliberately with students and families ensuring they know what constitutes racial harassment and MPS. E, regularly reference the proclamation and working definitions so every stakeholder in the school community is familiar with it. F, develop and distribute what I would call 911 cards that allow students to report to a staff member when their education has been disrupted or they have been racially or otherwise harassed. G, develop and reference a checklist if then process for building administrators to assist in determining whether racial harassment has taken place and appropriate action has been taken regarding perpetrator, victim, teacher, and other students and staff. And finally, H, look at MPS policies holistically regarding any incident that may result in discipline, including restorative. For example, in the case of freedom of speech issues, to focus on any acts of insubordination regarding district policies or if an action causes substantial disruption or obstruction of any function in the school, not necessarily just a freedom of speech opinion issue. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to any feedback you may have from me in the future. Thank you, thank you for your time, and thank you for joining us tonight, Mr. Mulvaney. We appreciate it. Okay. Mr. Chapman, nice to see you again. Yep. How are you tonight? Well. Good. Thanks for joining us. You have the floor. First of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you, MPS, um, Dow Chemical Company, uh, the staff that put together the DEI program for Midland Public Schools. Um, the effort that has gone into this um, makes me proud to be a member of the teaching staff here in the district and also um, parent of three students who graduated from Midland Public Schools. Um, I am so grateful for the need for DEI and the recognition that the board has taken on uh, for this need to make sure that all students feel like they have a sense of belonging in Midland Public Schools regardless of race, sexual orientation, gender, or religion. It does not escape me that this is a courageous step when fully implemented. 
The racial aspect of DEI is particularly challenging. For over 400 years, systemic racism has impacted every facet of American life. The Boer Pro Proclamation has positioned MPS to dismantle our institutionalized racism. This first step is critical in telling all students that they belong at MPS and it's just as critical in telling the racists that your bigotry does not have a place in our schools. I'll refer to this dual message as inclusive and exclusive. We want all of our students to experience an inclusive environment and any exclusive behavior will not be tolerated. Unfortunately, our handling of a recent event has skewed this message and gives DEI the appearance of window dressing. When a Dow Cross Country runner displays a white power sign for, for a team photo, there was a swift reaction, and I took personal comfort in knowing that we as a district condemned this type of bigotry. A few days later, another Dow Cross Country runner wore a t-shirt to Midland High School featuring the same terroristic sign. Fortunately, the teacher, aware, sent the student to the office. In about 15 minutes, the student returned to class and the issue and what ensued is not very clear. The student would be suspended, the student the, the, the suspension was appealed, the district backed down, no the district didn't back down. The parents did not want the suspension so the suspension didn't happen. The student remains in class without suspension. Just as a drop, just as a, just as a rock drops in the water, so this one ax has a continual ripple effect. Teachers questions if we really mean what we say as a district. Other students within the classroom conjure up their own schemes to test the boundaries. Teachers feel unsupported. Teachers refuse to be the first line of defense because bigotry is still too easy to overlook. I refuse to overlook it. Just last year, Britain Torrent murdered 51 people in New Zealand. While in court, being tried for 92 counts of murder and attempted murder, he proudly displayed the white power sign. Some may say that I am too harsh I am jumping to too many conclusions by comparing a Midland student to the likes of Torrent or to Dylan Roof, who sat in a prayer meeting with nine people and then murdered them point blank. My response is real simple. If it looks like a duck, if it sounds like a duck, it must be a duck. A student who flashes a sign associates with racists, and then wears the shirt to apparently recruit other students must be a racist. Now, if I had my way, the student would not have been given, the student would have been given the choice of two options, suspension or participate in a meeting with his parents and the teacher and a DEI representative that would explain to the parent and the, the parent and the student, the inclusive and exclusive focus of the district and give the student the opportunity to make MPS a more inclusive environment. The student would then be allowed to disassociate from his behavior. The class and the teacher would be able to move on without, negative, without the negative ripple effects of his actions. It is my hope that we will learn from this experience and minimize the ripple effects of future racial issues. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. We appreciate you coming in. Thanks, Jenny. And we appreciate your comments.
Mr. Krause. Eric Krause? Now. Oh, you hear me? We can hear you. All right. I'm Eric Krause, math teacher in my 25th year and the father of a chemic and the varsity boys basketball coach for 19 years. Uh, before I begin, I want to make clear that I am coming to you not as a bitter, near the end of the road employee. <laughs> Maybe I'm not there. On the contrary, I truly have a passion for Midland High, the students, the faculty, and the administrators have had. One of them was out there, Mr. Jaster, I think. I have loved being here, and I still do. Also, you, the board, I just want to say you're in a tough position. No matter what you do, someone will be angry. From a very tiny level of being a varsity basketball coach for years, I can empathize with you. And by the way, since I'm here, as the oldest and the most experienced basketball coach in the Saginaw Valley League, I have to state, honestly, I agree with your handling of our sports situation as of this time. Figured if some people are going to get mad at you, I might as well join the fight and get some more people mad at me. <laughs> anyway, having said all that, let's get to the reason why I'm here. I'm here to express my disagreement with downtown administration's handling of an incident that had a very clear and well-intentioned racist message. The message so strongly violates our proclamation versus racism that I'm still very angry about it weeks later. I made my opinion known very clearly and loudly um, a few weeks ago. A little bit after that, you know, Mike Sherrill sent out an email addressing the situation to his credit. And in it, he stated some staff members, probably me, um, feel we backed down. We didn't. Well, here's why I disagree, a few reasons. The first statement of our proclamation, the board is committed to eliminating racism, bigotry, hate and violence in any form. The incident which Mr. Chapman spoke about, where a student that I feel is fully aware of the meaning of what he did, really bore no consequences. I'll repeat, I believe you back down. The board number five, the statement is the board is committed to practices so students, families, community members, and staff feel safe, safe, visible, valued, respected, and connected. The teacher involved, who was heroic in my opinion, uh, did not really feel all that supported, did not feel like the credibility had been retained. There were some students in class that uh, were shocked but they couldn't really speak out. And their staff that when they were informed of this incident weeks later were uh, shocked and angry. Imagine being a person of color in that classroom. <laughs> Safe. Safe. Let me repeat, you back down. Number nine, our statement, conduct and policies. There's a, there was a one day suspension levied, uh, was appealed. According to our appeal process of the paperwork I read, suspension of more than one school day, but not more than 10 may be appealed. I was always on the impression in my years of experience that you couldn't appeal something of just one day. Maybe I'm wrong. Also, number nine, we commit to educating students and staff on the impact of their actions and fully understanding the harm they've committed. Speak to the people in that class, speak to the teacher. That didn't happen. You back down. I spoke this summer commending you, and you deserve it, on the proclamation. I also warned you. I'm not sure if you remember it. Not sure if anyone remembers the warning I issued. You can look it up. I said, you're going to take heat for this. I know where we live. You're going to take heat. Are you ready? You said yes. In basketball, sometimes when a ref makes a uh, questionable call and the person shoots a free throw and they miss, you know, we say, ball don't lie. Ball don't lie. We back down. 
We weren't ready. I strongly urge you to reconsider your actions regarding this situation. And I stress to you, we can do better. You're good people. Good, good people. I know a number of you. You're good people. We are Midland. We don't back down. People have asked me, you know, why am I doing this? <laughs> why am I up here? You know, just settle off in the distance and retire. Shouldn't it be, why wouldn't I do this? Why wouldn't I do this? There's a Friday message in Melanie. I. <laughs> For years, I used to kind of poke fun of it. I liked it. And it was uh, like every now and then, you know, it was something like, you know, you're fine just the way you are. And I'd always tease my students. I go, no, you're not, because if you were fine, we wouldn't be saying this every Friday. And the kids say, shut up, Krauss, and you know, we'd laugh. There's one point in there. It's always the right time to do the right thing. <laughs> Why am I doing this? I'm a chemic. The way I coach, we don't back down. We don't back down. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Krause. We appreciate you joining us tonight. I think we might have lost him. <laughs> okay, we have one more uh, speaker uh, waiting to address the board. That is Ryan Shatner. Ryan, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Ryan, thanks for joining us. Certainly. Um, Ryan Shackner, I have a, a kid at uh, Chestnut Hill, a steps uh, daughter at Northeast, and a stepson at Midland High. And I, I guess I'm just here to ask a question. If the board and superintendent took every possible measure before closing elementary school, um, I'm sure you are aware that early education is the most important. And I'm not sure how my kindergarten son is going to have a quality education if he's home and not with his teacher. So I guess that's my only question. I know you're not going to answer any questions. And I'm not going to talk and talk and talk. That's, I just hope you guys are considering you know, everything. We absolutely are, Ryan. And I, I can tell you right now, we've taken every possible precaution. And this is... This is something that weighs heavy on all of us. Um, a lot of us have children in the district. I have four in two different schools, and we're all in the same position. Um, it is just an extraordinary time and uh, something that we're adapting to on a near day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but you, sh you should be able to find on our website um, a list of the precautions and all the efforts uh, that we've made thus far to, to keep our kids face-to-face -face or to at least give our, our district families that option. Um, which is uh, something that a lot of districts uh, did not offer. So we're trying. We, we, we fought and fought. Um, but I think, you know, like you see the cartoons where you, put, you plug a hole in the dam and pretty soon you run out of fingers and toes. Uh, I think we're there. We're, we're out of fingers and toes and the leaks are still coming. All right. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Megan, I think there's nobody else. We're good? Okay. All right, folks. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, next up, we have our CIA. Uh, we have some curriculum instruction assessment minutes. Uh, Lynn. The CIA committee met on Tuesday, April 16th, and the first item of business was the sex education oh, sorry, advisory board. Steve Poole confirmed the 2021 Sex Education and Birth Control Advisory Board. Reverend Wally Mayton continues as a co-chair along with Steve. Overall, the number of teenage pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases has decreased over the last three years. Next, we talked about the NWEA update. Allison Cicinelli, Gen Service, and Ann Sheffer gave a review of the NWEA MAP Growth Assessment Readiness and Rollout. Key points included an overview of initial district data by grade level, 
MPS trends slightly above national average. The MAP growth is also part of our district continuous improvement goal areas of safe collaborative and equitable culture and balanced assessment system. Margaret Doan gave a principal's perspective on using data school-wide, grade level, and classroom level. Lastly, we had a DEI update. Amy Beasley shared the DEI project teams that are aligned to the subcommittee with an update and status of each. The first two teams to launch are the DEI skill sets project team and the active ally resource group project team. We adjourned at 245 and we met today and those minutes will be forthcoming at the next meeting. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Next up, we have item 5.2. Uh, Penny Miller Nelson is going to tell us about the uh, 2021 Advisory Board on Instruction in Sex Education and Birth Control. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Member Baker just mentioned in the minutes, uh, we have announced our 2021 Advisory Board on Education in, uh, excuse me, on Instruction in Sex Education and Birth Control. Uh, Reverend Wally Mayton and Steve Poole have agreed to be our co-chairs. We also have Amy Jaster, who is a health professional and parent, Michael Donovan as a health teacher, Marnie Williams, who is a health teacher and a parent, Owen Jaswiak serves as our student rep, and he is a student at Midland High currently, Evelyn Presnell is another student rep from Dow High, Dr. Jeff Newman is a health professional and parent, and Mr. Brad Blasey is our board member who uh, serves on that committee. This is a requirement of the Michigan Department of Ed. We meet only when necessary and have not had the necessity to meet for some time. So this is for your information. Okay, thank you. And thanks, Brad, for serving as our liaison to the board. Well, uh, next up, we have an action item. Uh, Penny, if you want to take 5.3. I do. We'll get some slides up here in just a second. So as promised, every month we will have our uh, reconfirmation meeting per uh, the legislation from, uh, from our state. And these are the same slides that uh, we've seen in the past, so we will skim through them. Uh, the first is just to reconfirm instructional delivery. Nothing has changed as of today in how we are delivering instruction as written in the plan. I emphasize as of today because next month when we bring you this plan, we will reflect the move to remote learning more specifically. Our levels of instruction of our special populations has not changed either. As I mentioned to you uh, last month, these percentages are based on enrollment in the full remote setting as well as the non-remote setting, which includes face-to-face -face and hybrid. <clears throat> so these will remain static until we transition students at semester. This is the one piece that will change each month. This is a required summary of public comment that we've received. I'll draw your attention to the fact that we certainly don't shy away from uh, the critical feedback as well. We have a requirement to share that. So again, we have several parents who have requested changing of their learning environment for their students. We have some that want to move from virtual to face-to-face -to -face and some face-to-face -to, -face to virtual prior to the semester timeline. And of course, we're holding firm on that. We have received several emails of appreciation that we continue to offer the multiple learning formats. So we're proud of that. Uh, praise for our elementary virtual format in particular, since we have MPS teachers working directly with students. We have parents expressing concern that there is too much homework in the secondary virtual format. Students who are in Edgenuity in particular and Mr. Lauer continues to try to strategize with students and families on how to manage expectations and how to manage that workload. Interestingly, we have parents expressing disappointment with the music department restrictions that we're holding firm on those health and safety protocols. And I say interesting because the bullet under that is that we've also received feedback praising us for holding the line on those uh, more strict health and safety protocols for music. We also had the October Parent Information Committee meeting and our topic was social emotional learning and there was lots of favorable feedback about how we're tending to students' well-being. I will also include the two pieces of public comment that we received tonight 
that pertained uh, to our, our COVID plan. So I'll add those and those will be um, uploaded to our transparency page. The last piece of this is our two-way interaction rates, which I'll ask Jeff to speak to. Thanks, Penny. As we discussed last month, this table represents the percentage of students who have achieved at least two two-way interactions per week. And I think I'll avoid reading those line by line, but the three columns are all students, obviously in column one, 100% 1 remote, and then the last column is a combination of our hybrid and in-person students. And so what I'll do instead is just kind of give averages. So uh, for this past month, since the previous board meeting, the all students are averaging about 92.5% uh, of the two-way interactions required for pupil accounting. Those who are 100% remote, that's about an 85% average. And those that are not 100% remote are about a 95, just over 95 and a quarter percent average. Compared to the previous month, those are all down slightly. Um, my assumption is uh, two weeks ago we had the week of the election, which was a short week. It was a four-day instead of a five-day week. And then last week especially, really going back two weeks, we were seeing much higher than normal quarantine rates. So I think all those things have impacted. And so uh, just to give you a sense of uh, the slip, it's, it's averaged about a 2% drop. So in the first column, all students I just listed, that was about a 92.5%. Previous month average was about 94. Um, the 100% remote group, I had said this month's average was 85. Previous month was 87. And that holds true for the last column as well. This month was 95% previous month was just over 97. So again, I think that uh, over the past two weeks, those factors that I mentioned are what have influenced the slight decrease. Okay. All right, so at this time, I will take a motion to adopt the extended learning program reconfirmation. Make a motion to approve item 5.3 district's extended COVID-19 learning plan reconfirmation. Support. <clears throat> Motion by Phil, support by Pam. Any discussion? Item 5.3. In the last table, um, we see those numbers are declining down. Are there key numbers in there, or this is something that we're required to record this? What's the background of that table? Is there a certain numbers that if we were to hit those that are going to be flagged and say, oh, we need to do something? Correct. We're well above it. Um, it is a required, but Jeff knows the exact numbers. It's a 75% threshold. Yes. If you fall below that, you run the risk of not uh, being able to um, <laughs> capture some of those uh, pupils in your student count. And then, you know, there's some implications possibly for extended period for funding if that were to go on for a prolonged period of time. Just that, right, it's really the quarantine, let's change that as much as anything. So you went from uh, two weeks ago, about 100 or something that were quarantined today, were 480, 490, I think it was today. And so that 2% uh, drop, 2% of 7,000, quarantine less is driving that down. And that's the 75 is the face-to-face -face number? Or that's a I believe it's all, all overall. That's overall. all. Seventy-five percent overall. Okay. Which again, our first column is is strong. It's, we've been in the nineties, so we're still yep. in a good position. Okay. I'll just remind you too, Mr. Blazy, the seventy-five percent threshold is as it pertains to this particular report under the um, extended COVID learning plan. It is not necessarily the same information that we would be reporting in the same way for people accounting purposes. So okay. people just, accounting I, requires I don't mean to the two-way interaction more, in the virtual only. Right. So the, the way that we are reporting this data is specific to what's required for this particular extended COVID learning reconfirmation plan. Clear as mud, right? But yeah. it's, it's <laughs> what MDA does to us a lot. So. I'll just say rest assured that we and teachers and, and building administrators, we're all really working hard to make sure that students are attending and we're following up uh, when they're not. Okay. So do we have concern that when we transition in a week from now that do we have a feeling of what those numbers are going to look like? Are they going to 
obviously going to trend down. They could. They but could, but the two, two, the two two-way interactions are fairly low threshold. I don't want to jinx myself here. Sure. <laughs> to, to reach that, though. Yep. And can I would add that attendance will continue remotely. So mm -hmm. through the virtual meetings, every um, Google Meet session that a teacher hosts for students, uh, there's a printout or a, I think it's an email confirmation of all the students who logged in during that session so the teacher is going to capture all those attendance rates. So there's certainly a risk that some kids could get lost uh, periodically, but we are going to have a plan in each building for administrators to support the teachers in the follow-up just to make sure we don't have kids. Missing one day is you know, not a big deal, as Mike referenced. The two two-way interactions is a relatively low bar, but uh, we don't want to have patterns emerge that become more you know more permanent so we're going to work on that right away okay mm -hmm. okay all in favor say aye. Aye. aye aye any opposed okay motion carries thank you next up ffo item 6.1 mary you have some minutes for us yes thank you we met on november 2nd um Rick Vanderpool uh, from Barton Madelow presented the bills for the stadium bleacher replacement and the recommendation for award will be brought to this meeting. Mr. Shar and Mr. Bruton discussed the following topics with the committee. The September financials, financial statements were discussed with an emphasis on continuing COVID-19 impacts. Um, purchase orders and purchase card expenses above the bid threshold were reviewed. Um, number two, executive summary report. The placement of the bond uh, executive summary in the board agenda was discussed with the committee. The committee recommended to keep the current placement of the report as it is considered to be supporting document in line with the other support documents provided in the same section of the agenda. There are three, the tra uh, tractor purchase bids for three Kubota Tractors for maintenance and snow removal reviewed. A recommendation for the award will be brought to this meeting. Um, insurance review. Results of exploring splitting the lines of property and liability coverage among vendors were reviewed with the committee. A recommendation for award will be brought to uh, the special board meeting on November 4th. N number five, summer tax collection resolution. The board will be asked to approve the annual request for the city of Midland to collect half the school tax levy, including debt surface during the summer tax collection period. Six, diversity, equity, and inclusion updates were provided on the director of DEI posting and interview process. Our next meeting is Monday, December 7th at 5 p.m. Thank you, Mary. Okay, next up we have a series of action items beginning with item 6.2. This is the summer tax collection request. Uh, Mr. Bruton, are you? Yes. Okay. Yep, thank you. Um, as Mary just said in the minutes there, it is a standing practice for us at MPS to ask the city of Midland to collect our taxes over two cycles, a summer and a winter cycle. And state law says that if we are going to ask them to continue that by January the 1st, we need to give them notice that we would like them to continue that. So presented before you tonight is a resolution asking the City of Midland to continue with that practice. That's something that we greatly appreciate as a district as that collection uh, greatly helps us with our cash flow during those periods of time in which we do not receive state aid payments. So you have a resolution presented for you tonight asking for the City of Midland to continue that request. I move, I move to approve the resolution for the levy of summer 2021 taxes on property located within the school district and within the City of Midland. A complete copy of the resolution shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Support? Okay. Does this have to be roll call on this one? It does not. Okay. Okay, motion by Phil, support by Mary. Any discussion from the board regarding item 6.2? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Next up, action item 6.3. This is a track to purchase. Mr. Bruton. Thank you. Um, when we were developing our budget for this year last spring, Mr. Mogenberg brought to us a proposal during the budget process to purchase three tractors for three separate campuses within Midland Public Schools. 
the Woodcrest campus, the Siebert Jefferson campus, and also the Plymouth Northeast campus. And he would like to purchase these tractors to help with maintenance efforts, including lawn mowing and snow plowing. And we did accept bids, and we are recommending tonight to issue a purchase order to the low bidder Lingle Equipment of Saginaw, Michigan, in the amount of $56,955 for three four-wheel drive diesel tractors to assist with the maintenance that Mr. Mogenberg is requesting from us. All right. Thank you very much. I'll accept the motion. I make a motion to accept the tractor purchase in, uh, uh, from Lingle Equipment Incorporated, $56,955. Support. Support. Motion by Mary, support by Phil. Any discussion regarding item 6.3? All Make, in favor? Makes sense. It does. <laughs> makes sense. All in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up, item 6.4. This is a bond bid package for 21-201. 21, 21 uh, it says Brian or Mike. Yep. Brian can give the financials. I can add to it if we need to. Yep, okay. thank you. Um, so bid package 21201 was mentioned in the presentation that Mr. Vanderpool and Mr. Dombro gave to us earlier this evening. Um, this is for the replacement of the bleachers at the community stadium. Um, as you know, in the past, we've had to do some structural work to make sure that we were dealing with some of the erosion issues that were happening over at the stadium. And so we put out to bid the complete replacement of those stands. And you will see that we're presenting to you tonight that bid plus alternate A1. And for clarification for the board, alternate A1 is actually an extension of the bleachers. And the extension of those bleachers will make up for seating that's going to be lost due to widened aisles and extra handicapped seating that had to be added due to code. So we will not be losing seating. Um, and this extension and site work that's related to alternate A1 added a little bit of cost to the scope of the work. So after receiving bids, we are recommending two awards for this bid package. One award for the grandstands themselves to E&D Specialty Stands out of North Colling, New York, um, for a total of $717,880. And the site work to Pat's Grade All of Midland, Michigan, for $318,000 for a total award of $1,035,880 to do the community stadium bleacher upgrades make a motion to approve item 6.4 for the awarding of the bid package 21-201 with the alternate for $1,035,880. Support. Motion by Phil, support by John. Any discussion regarding item 6.4? Does, does this include the uh, change that has to happen to the spectator side as well? That is correct. Okay. Yes. And this, so it'll this be is coming. On the vis on Correct. The yeah. 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 And then um, it also it, it was an extension from money that we had so savings. We had this is this will be covered by your bid savings, um, and, it's, and it's washed in their interest in bid savings. Both. Let's so make sure we say that correct. And then for the handicap seating, is that where is that, and are there rails too, or how does that work? So handicaps up at the top, but the railing moved the, the aisleways out, so you would have lost a certain number of seats. And so the stands will be extended a little bit over to the hills there, the presently the grassy part of the hill, to make sure we do not lose seating. Okay. Okay. We have plenty of seating in the stadium, but that's not necessarily on the home side, if you've been to some of those contests. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't really afford to lose that home side. Right. So is it part of the verbiage in the package, I'm sure, and through the interview process, that E&D was well aware of the special situation that we have at our stadium with a new press box, a new track, and a new yeah. field? Yeah. yeah, they are. And they came up, uh, I think it was part of what, how they got the bid, um, a different design to do that. If they're going to reach in from the side, I think, Brad, if I recall, the explanation from Barton Mal. So they're going to come from the side, remove from the sideways, especially with the extension. So we're going to touch on the hills a little bit versus up the top. So we, they don't do that. So yes, they were. Yeah, and Barton Mal actually told us that they were the ones that spent the most time doing their bid. So they spent the most time at site doing all the research on how to do it to address your concern. Yeah, they really felt real comfortable thought. with the idea. Okay. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much.
Okay, next up we have information for gifts totaling $17,516.25. Thank you, Mr. Thron. Um, as you just stated, we have 20 gifts for information to present to you tonight for the total that you just stated, and they range all the way from continued support by the Hollenbeck Foundation to support Luna, the therapy dog, over at Central Park, all the way to Kindness Week contributions from the Midland Area Community Foundation. And as is our tradition, we will honor each of these donations with a letter from the Board of Education and also on the credits to the meeting tonight. And we are very grateful to all of them for their support of the Midland Public Schools and the programs. Um, we also have item 6.54, action, two gifts totaling $15,545. One gift from the HHL Sports Boosters for $7,000 for fall and winter sports equipment, and another from the Woodcrest PTO for $8,545. And we would appreciate your action tonight to accept those gifts so we can get those processed. Absolutely. Make a motion to accept item 6.6 .6 for $15,545. Support. Motion by Phil. Support by Mary. Any discussion? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Absolutely. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. We uh, humbly accept those gifts. <laughs> um, next up, item seven, human resources. Did we have, I'm sorry, did we have minutes, John? We do not this month. Not, okay, not this month. Okay, so Mr. Jaster. Thank you. Uh, would you like me to do 7.1 and point two together here? Yes, please, thank you. Okay, for 7.1, the following staff members have announced their retirements. Uh, first, Miss Mary Jo Griffin, been a teacher at Adams Elementary. Her last day was October 30th of 2020. An upcoming retirement, Miss Jana Kulik. She's our enrollment in McKinney Vento specialist here at the admin building, and her last day will be December 31st, 2020. The next section, 7.2 in memoriam, the board and staff extend their deepest sympathy to the families of Miss Ruth Lois Martin. She passed away on October 22nd, 2020. Miss Martin was hired in 1958, worked as a music teacher, coordinator of language arts, and was a building principal at Cook Elementary. She retired in 1998. And then also Mr. Craig Winslow Pelletier, he passed away October 16th, 2020. He was the manager uh, of the faculty athletic, er, faculty athletic manager, excuse me, of uh, Midland High School. He was also an English teacher there in the building. He was first hired in 1970 and retired in 2004. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have item 8. This is correspondence to and from the board. Uh, 8.1 is letters from the Board of Education uh, to three entities there. Uh, they can be found in the agenda. Uh, item 8.2 uh, is regarding letters to the Board of Education. Uh, they are FOIA requests. They can also be found in the agenda. Uh, item 9 is just a list of our regularly scheduled meetings uh, going through May 17 of 2021. Uh, that brings us to item 10. This is our study discussion session 10.1. Uh, this is the, uh, we are going to now establish the um, Board of Education Officer Nominating Committee. And so in front of us, if you guys could just fill out the uh, put a check by two names. Uh, historically, the board president is, is always on the nominating committee, so we need two other board members. Um, Megan will then tally the votes, and I will read the results aloud. Thank you, Megan. is where somebody says stop the counting. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. yeah. yeah. Scott, while she's doing that, should I make a motion to extend meetings? Uh, I'm sure if you want to close session as well. Let's get it yeah. There. Yeah, let's do that. Go ahead, Phil. I'll make I'll make a motion that we extend by I'm thinking 45 minutes to 10.15 at the latest. We can do that. Support. 
motion by Phil to extend our meeting time to 1015. That's one hour from now. Uh, we'll be extended 45 minutes. Support by Mary. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. You can go on to your comments if you have any. Sure. Uh, we'll, we'll move along to 10.2 uh, while Megan is tallying the votes. Uh, any questions from board members regarding points of clarification uh, on anything that was discussed tonight before we turn the floor over to Mike for some comments before we go into closed session? Okay, Mike? Megan's got the countdown, and I'll save my comments while we go into, into closed session for evaluation, so there's okay. no sense in it. Fair enough. Okay, the board nominating committee will consist of myself, Pam Singer, and Phil Rausch. And so we will uh, get together. What is our what is our timeline, Pam or Mike, um, for the three of us to to meet? For your January twenty, our January organizational meeting is not twenty; it's a little January earlier. January eleventh. January eleventh. Okay, so we'll get together uh, at some point before then and, and hash out probably mid-December would be good okay we'll work on that thank you okay um, at this point we will take a motion to go into closed session so moved motion oh, I'm sorry motion Support. by Mary just take your purpose yeah oh, oh we're gonna I'm sorry For the we're purpose of uh, superintendent evaluation thank you support I'll explain that to you going in you're performing it but you don't take action until to the next month Correct. No. Motion by Mary, support by Pam. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We're going to be in closed session.